On the 15th of June 1215, Magna Carta was sealed at Runnymede. Magna Carta, meaning Great Charter, was a document which set out the rights of the barons of England and put limits on the royal powers of kings. It was intended to return peace to England, but was only legally valid for three months before the Pope cancelled it. It was then reissued in 1216, 1217, and again in 1225, when it eventually became part of English law. But what led the barons to produce such a document? And what was England like in 1215? In 1215, nine-tenths of the population lived in the countryside and worked on land which had been held by the same family for generations. Labourers could be paid a penny a day, and not every man was free. Tenants could owe their rent in one of two ways, either in cash or in service. Those tenants who owed their rent in labour services were known as villains and had little choice about how they spent their days. A villain was not allowed to leave his holding or give his daughter away in marriage without his landlord's permission, permission which had to be paid for. These tenants could not take their cases to the public courts. Their disputes, whether between themselves or with their landlord, had to go through the manorial courts, which the landlord controlled. Whilst the majority of the population lived on a penny a day, £10 a year was enough for a country gentleman to maintain a comfortable lifestyle. However, during John's reign, prices rose sharply. At the beginning of the 13th century, an ox could be purchased for 40 shillings, but by 1215 it would cost 80 shillings. This increase in the cost of living not only impacted upon those poorer members of society, but on the artisans, craftsmen and middle classes too. In King John's reign, nearly a third of England was forest. However, forest often meant inhabited countryside, and this could be woodland, fields, meadows, and even towns and villages. By declaring an area of England as a forest, the king created a royal monopoly over the management of the area and the distribution of local resources. These resources had previously been enjoyed by local landlords and tenant farmers. Offences within the king's forest such as keeping dogs, hunting, or clearing areas of land without permission, were severely punished, sometimes with mutilation, or even death. If an offence occurred, and no offender could be found, the whole village was liable for a very heavy fine. Under John's father, Henry II, there had been a considerable increase in the authority of the king's courts, and these were increasingly attended by semi-professional judges. Making access to royal justice easier for people encouraged them to make greater use of these law courts. However, Henry II's legal reforms had very little to do with ideas of rights or equality. Instead, the courts were used as a device for upholding royal power. From the king's courts came the image of the English king as answerable only to God. The king himself appeared to stand in judgment over his subjects' quarrels and disputes profiting hugely from them whilst he did so. The law had the tendency to bolster the authority of the king, rather than protect the rights of individual subjects. In the Middle Ages, the church was extremely powerful, and so were the people who controlled it. In theory, senior positions within the church were elected by a cathedral chapter or by the monks of an abbey. In practice, the King of England controlled these appointments, often choosing his most trusted servants to take up these positions of responsibility and influence. The wealth of the church could be as much as £80,000 each year, and if a bishopric within England was empty, the crown collected its income. Often it was in the king's interest to keep these bishoprics empty for as long as possible so that he could make even more money. John kept the Bishopric of Lincoln vacant for almost two years and made a profit of £2,649. John caused problems by openly disagreeing with the Pope over the election of the new Archbishop of Canterbury in 1205. John wanted his own candidate, John de Grey, Bishop of Norwich, to be elected, but the Pope's preferred candidate was Stephen Langton. England's clergy agreed, and John refused Stephen Langton entry into the country. The Pope responded severely, 
and for six whole years no church bells rang out, no mass was celebrated, and people could not be buried in consecrated ground. John only gave in and accepted the Pope's choice for the Archbishop of Canterbury when he needed his help to stop the French from invading. If the king could win the approval of a few of the powerful baronial families in England, he would have a successful reign. A wealthy magnate, who often had 20 or 30 manors, had an annual income of several hundred pounds. But these families held their estates directly from the king, which meant they were the king's tenants. In return for their tenancies, they were expected to serve and help him, either by supporting him politically or by giving him military service and financial aid. The king could also make large sums of money out of these baronial families. Baronial heirs had to pay an inheritance tax, called relief, in order to inherit their father's lands. If the heir was underage, the king took him into custody as one of his wards, and he seized the estates too. The degree of control which the king had over baronial inheritances and marriages meant he had great powers of patronage. His trusted servants could be turned into millionaires overnight, and baronial families were reliant upon the king for their privileged status. All 12th and 13th century English kings used this system, but none as blatantly as King John, who was always suspicious of men's loyalties. John inherited lands stretching from the Scottish to the Spanish borders, but during his reign he failed to maintain and defend this vast empire which had been left to him by his predecessors. The Plantagenet dynasty had started when Geoffrey, Count of Anjou, married Matilda, heiress to the throne of England. Their eldest son, Henry II, was therefore not only heir to the Kingdom of England, but also to his father's estates in Anjou and the Duchy of Normandy. He later acquired Aquitaine through his marriage to Eleanor, the most desirable heiress in all of Europe. However, the Plantagenet kings found that trying to govern an empire both sides of the English Channel was an impossible challenge. In 1204, John lost Normandy, Anjou and Maine to the French. This left the English crown with Poitou and Aquitaine. Despite these massive losses, John continued to tax his people heavily, which the people of England resented bitterly. England in 1215 was not a fair and equal society, and John's rule was seen as increasingly tyrannical. John was able to exploit the judicial system, implement heavy taxation, despite his massive losses of territory in France, use his power in the royal forest to increase his revenues, and employ a system of royal patronage, which bred resentment amongst the barons and nobility. The baronial rebellion of 1215, which ultimately led to the sealing of Magna Carta, was not a direct rebellion against King John himself, but against the excesses of successive Angevin kings. This leads us to ask, was King John as bad as he seems? Or was he merely a product of his times and his family? In the next video, we will explore popular perceptions of King John and decide whether or not he was a good medieval king.